comfortable with that, I'd encourage you just to turn your cameras off. Um, at the end of the presentations, you're more than welcome to come off mute and uh, ask questions or type in the chat room questions as well. And so that's the ways you can interact with us. But I would invite you to keep your microphones on mute through the presentation. As I was saying, I'm a critical care doctor and my lived experience was working in an environment like this where many patients are super sick and we're having to make decisions around the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments. And it was my lived experience that, um, as you can appreciate, when you're so sick that you can't talk for yourselves, we call our family members to come in and participate in this kind of decision-making, life and death decision-making. And people are already stressed about having loved ones, but it was my lived experience that um, these substitute decision-makers, often family members, were ill-prepared for the role that we put them in, in making these decisions. And consequently, they, we added stress to their experience. Uh, you know, and, and maybe some of you have been in that role or uh, lived through this yourself. But my belief is that if we can think about these things in advance and prepare in advance for that role, even though it's a difficult experience, it'll go a lot better. So that motivated me to step out and get involved in what we call advanced care planning or thinking ahead and planning ahead for future medical care. Um, but then as I started doing that, I realized that, you know, it's not just a failure to think ahead and plan ahead for your medical care. We as Canadians and perhaps we as humans <laughs> neglect, broadly speaking, thinking ahead and planning ahead. And so it's my uh, privilege and opportunity to partner with other planning professionals to bring you this program tonight. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're doing it now is, uh, as Benjamin Franklin said, there's only two certain things in life, death and taxes. And, and so nationally, we declare April 16th as National Advanced Care Planning Day. And so as a part of a way to promote this concept of thinking ahead and planning ahead, we're putting on this webinar uh, with my colleagues. We kind of see this form of advanced planning as a three-legged stool that what if something unexpected, untoward, adverse happened to me or to a loved one? Uh, how, how would things go from a medical decision-making point of view, from a financial, what would the impact on my finances be? What would the impact on the, the legal preparations and the legal documents that I may or may not have prepared? And so that's our agenda tonight is to discuss those three aspects because it's now when we're well and able and using a legal term competent um, that we should be putting these plans in place. The time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining, not when it's raining, so to speak. And so the outline for tonight is I'm going to share about 25 minutes of content related to the medical side of things. And then I'm gonna pass uh, the baton or the talking stick over to Sarah LeBeau from Davidson and Williams lawyer here in town who's going to speak to the legal aspects of planning for serious illness and then over to Carol Hayima from Investors Group who's going to speak about the financial aspects of planning for serious illness and then we'll pause and open it up and again as I said at the top of the program happy to have you engage either in the chat room or uh, turn off your mic turn on your mics and uh, engage us with some questions. So um, yeah, in context here, we're living through a pandemic, but even if we didn't have a pandemic amongst us, um, we have to face the reality that at the wrong time we can cross the street and get hit by a car, or at some point in our lives, we may have a major medical complication, say a massive heart attack or a stroke. And again, I'm not trying to say doom and gloom, it's just the reality of being a human and living in our mortal experiences that we will experience uh, serious illness. And as is advocated here, it's good to think ahead and put those plans in place. I can imagine that through this pandemic, either for yourself or for a dear loved one, you've worried about what might happen if they get sick, if you get sick, what might the right medical plan of action be? How will I fare? How will I turn out? And what would happen if I'm too sick that I can't speak for myself? Who's going to advocate for me 
and engage with the doctors and make those decisions. And this is exactly what we're going to be talking about, or at least my part of this presentation is to um, really speak to the, the value of informing yourself of what happens when you get sick and how decisions are made and who might speak, best speak for you. Lots of research evidence documenting that if you don't think ahead, if you don't engage in this form of planning, things might not go well for you. Uh, you may receive the wrong care, the wrong medical care. And most commonly, that's what we call an intensification of care when you're seriously ill or at the end of life. So people spending days in ICU in, on machines only after 10 days or two weeks to succumb when in the first place, they were looking for an easy exit strategy out of life when they got seriously ill. And that has negative repercussions on the family. I've already alluded to the stress of decision-making as a negative impact on them if they're ill-prepared, but so too does being a witness to this intensification of care or to the wrong medical decision-making that leaves them stressed on the short-term and suffering on the long-term. Um, there are also negative effects on the healthcare system, but I won't dwell on those. All this to say that um, you know it's much more, it's better for you and your journey uh, if you thought ahead and planned ahead. Here's an anecdote from a woman who was listening to me opine about this subject. I had written an editorial in the local paper in Kingston when I lived there, and she wrote me a letter and she said, "Almost a year ago, my husband died um, at KGH." Oops. Um, my husband died at KGH with lung and heart disease. He was 78. I recently read an article that I had written in the, in the Whig Standard. I am one of those who is still suffering from seeing a loved one have to endure the pain of mechanical ventilation when he should have been offered palliative care. Someone in emergency should have known that we needed this based on the medical evidence and his history of many admissions in the previous year. Now, there's a couple of things that really stood out to me there. Um, number one, this is a year later after they had had this clinical encounter and she's still distressed so much so that she's motivated, you know, to, to write me and share with me. And she said a lot more in that letter than what I'm sharing with you. And the second is that she had an expectation that the healthcare system would do better by her or, or her husband. And I'm not trying to besmirch our wonderful publicly funded healthcare system, but it's a big complex system and you're one person. And when you get sick, you're very vulnerable and not able to best advocate for yourself. And so it's better for you if you are able to advocate for yourself or you empower your substitute decision maker to ha help you in that journey. Um, I'll, I'll say more about that in a few slides from now. And so I'm, I'm trying to pressure you to lean into this space and think ahead and plan ahead for your medical care. Now, I know, because I've done a lot of research and I've talked to a lot of people, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, maybe not you because you joined us on this webinar, but people out there who didn't join us on the webinar, I know what some of them might be thinking, right? They would say, well, you know what? I don't really have to put time and effort into this. My family know me. They'll know what's right for me. They'll do what's best for me. And then I have a quote here that from a critical care doctor who says, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting knee to knee with that family explaining the situation, the poor prognosis and struggling to make a life and death decision with about this loved one when the family are grieved because, oh, they, I've never talked about this. I don't know what my loved one would want and their anxiety and stress is palpable. So, yeah, so there's a disconnect here just because you have a loving family and they know you well doesn't mean they're going to be able to navigate this life and death space without hearing your voice and knowing specifically, you know, what your wishes are. So I hope I can rebut that concept and say, hey, if you really love your family and want to do them a favor and give them a gift, lean into this space, develop your plan, share it with them so they can hear your voice when they're called upon to serve on your behalf. Some of you might say, well, my you don't know my family. They're very difficult. They're very complex. This will be a difficult conversation full of conflict, blah, 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 blah. And then you talk to litigation lawyers and you realize that for these kinds of families that don't address it whilst the person is alive, 
it just ends up in the courts where that conflict explodes and it makes it difficult for all stakeholders. So much better to have navigated through that difficult conversation whilst you're alive. And there is professional help from social workers or other healthcare navigators. And we reference some of those on our website if you're looking for help um, to help you navigate that difficult conversation. Others might think, well, if it's important, why doesn't my doctor bring it up? Fair question, fair question. Um, particularly a primary care doctor who knows you and sees you. Um, we did a survey of um, in, in hospital. We talked to hundreds of patients in hospital, whether their doctor had engaged them about this planning conversation, whether they should be resuscitated, whether they should go to the ICU if they got seriously ill. And these are patients in hospital who have a doctor assigned to them, look after them. Um, and only a third of them acknowledged that they talked to the doctor. Only 20% of them said, yeah, we got some idea how sick we are, what our prognosis is. And then we went to the medical chart and we checked whether their values and preferences were congruent or agreed with the order on the medical chart. And it only agreed one in three times, which is to say, if you trust the system and the doctor that care for you um, to get it right for you, you got a one in three chance. And so I'm giving you some tools tonight that will increase those odds of success that you'll get the medical care right that's right for you. We then turned around and said to those same doctors working in hospitals across Canada, hey, why don't you? Why don't you engage with sick older people in hospital to make better decisions around the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments? And what I'm showing you here is a list of barriers. And we asked them to rate or rank the most important reasons why they didn't do that kind of conversation and the reasons are centered around the lack of preparedness. They say things like, oh, you know, my, my, the, my patient or, and or their family, they won't understand, they don't un they're not willing to accept, this, they're not ready to have this conversation. It's another way of saying I don't have the time or the emotional energy to really help my, pe my patients and I hope that they get better and are discharged and then I don't have to worry about it. So again, if you want to navigate this space, you're going to have to take responsibility yourselves. And I want to give you the tools to enable you to do that. Some of you might think, and uh, I hope Sarah doesn't take offense to my comment, what I'm about to say next, but some of you might think that because I've been to the lawyer, I can tick that box and say, I've done my advanced medical planning. And I just want you to think about the sensibility of that, of doing health planning with a lawyer. I mean, there's clearly a role for lawyers and Sarah will speak more to those legal forms, but in the context of those legal forms, what is the sensibility of having a lawyer do health planning? Well, no more sensible than putting me in a courtroom and expecting me to be able to navigate that conversation and do what's right um, by those people involved. And so we're trying to partner with lawyers and get them to help with the naming and capacitation of said substitute decision maker, but to take out of their toolkit any requirement to do health planning. Um, it's a little outside of their scope of practice and then just refer people to plan well guide to get the, the delineation of what that substitute decision maker might need to say or, or act upon the best wishes or interests of of, the, of the, the client or the patient. And one of the important reasons why those language phrases, um, instructional directives in the legal documents are not that helpful is because they're all framed under conditions of certainty. And you, you know them because you have them in your personal directives or maybe you have a living will and you've thought this through and you've said things like, well, if I am dying, then I don't want, or I do want this and this and this, or if I reach this state of, of hopelessness where there, you know, I'm in a vegetative existence, then this is what I want, or this is what I don't want. And I understand why you say that, but I just let you, I need to let you know that the point of decision-making where we're trying to make decisions with either you or your loved one about to apply or not to apply life-sustaining treatments is upstream. We don't know if you're dying at the point that you come to the ER short of breath with COVID pneumonia. There's a probability that you could die, but there's also a probability that you could recover. And so those instructions set forth at your kitchen table or in the law office that say, if I am dying, this is what I want, 
or this is what I don't want are not helpful. And so we're trying to get rid of that in its entirety and not frame this around end of life care, but rather serious illness. That's the title of this program tonight, advanced serious illness planning, um, which is different than planning for death. And uh, one of the epiphanies for me was because most people don't like to talk about death and dying. Um, even older people, hey, I'm healthy, I'm fit. I may be 83, but I'm not, I don't wanna think about the end because I'm still, you know, I'm still going. But all of us can appreciate, particularly under the conditions of a pandemic, that a serious illness can come at any time, whether I'm 83 or 53 or 33. And so it speaks to the importance of leaning into this space and thinking ahead and planning ahead mm -hmm you know, for serious illness. So let me walk you through a little bit of that conversation. When I talk to people and I say, well, we need to think about what might medical treatments might be right for you when you're seriously ill. A lot of them say back to me, well, and they look kind of quizzically at me, like, why are you even asking this question, doctor? Obviously, I just want you to keep me comfortable because they've been conditioned to think that when we're talking about treatments in the future, when they're seriously ill, they're, they're hearing or interpreting that as end of life care or terminal care. And again, to emphasize the point, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what a serious illness. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not always, it, it may be the right answer for you, but it's not always. Um, and so let me explain what I mean by serious illness. And the key there is the uncertainty of the outcome. There's a probability, it's serious enough that's a probability that you could die but uh, there's also a probability that you could recover. So again, examples of that are car accidents, COVID pneumonia, big heart attacks, strokes, other diseases, complications. Um, there's a high likelihood, particularly if you're older, that if you develop a serious illness, you will be incapacitated and not able to participate in decision-making yourself. And that's why you need to do it in advance so that you've documented your wishes and your preferences and your substitute decision maker, or as we refer to them in Alberta, your agent can step in for you. So having said all that, and you have this understanding of serious illness, the next most common conversation I have with people when I try to repeat myself and say, okay, now that you understand we're talking about serious illness, you know, what kind of things might be right for you? The next most common expression I hear is, and, and I know some of you are struggling with this right now, well, that all depends. It depends on how I'm gonna turn out. You know, if I'm going to turn out fine, I'd want you to do everything. If, if I'm going to turn out poorly, why wouldn't I just have you keep, my, keep me comfortable? And then I'm in this awkward position of trying to explain to you that I'm sorry, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know at the start of your journey where we're making these decisions to apply or not apply decision, uh, life-sustaining treatments, how you're going to turn out. And so in a way, we're moving forward under conditions of uncertainty. What do I mean by that? Well, think about every morning when you wake up. Don't all of you sort of listen to the weather report? I suppose the only certain thing on the weather report is it's gonna be a windy day in Southern Alberta. But sometimes you hear language like, well, there's a 60% probability of rain, you know, chance of major thunder shower. So what do you do with that information? Are you paralyzed by it? Or do you still have to make decisions and move through your day not sure if it's gonna rain or not, but you need to know if you're gonna adjust your activities and maybe stay indoors or not. If you're gonna go out, are you gonna bring an umbrella? Are you gonna wear a raincoat? So again, you're, you're moving forward, you're, you're making decisions even though you don't know what the outcome. Maybe that's a poor example, but it's the best way I try to illustrate what I mean by making decisions under conditions of uncertainty. We don't know what the outcome is when we're here having to document what our preferences are. And in fact, let me stress this point. We're not actually having you make decisions in advance. These are not um, decisions that are, you're gonna be held to, to the, or your substitute decision maker will be held to the letter of the law. No, this is an expression of a preference. And what I'm trying to illustrate on this slide here is how that expressed wish or that preference or that leaning, or I think this might be right for me, then gets incorporated into medical decision-making. When you're sick, the doctor needs to be able to do an assessment, have an understanding of your condition, put, it, put your values and preferences into the context, make a recommendation, and together, either you or your substitute decision maker will collaborate to make the decision that's right for you, okay? So this is what decision-making looks like when you're sick. 
It's a collaboration with the doctor. What does the doctor want to know? Values and preferences. Preferences are not a decision made. No, because you may have preferred the wrong thing because you weren't thinking about the context or you weren't aware of your prognosis. And so it may change as that conversation evolves with the doctor in the context of the disease problem that's facing you at that time in the future. So we're not talking about codifying instructions that will become legally binding in the future. No, we're talking about a leaning, a preference, a value statement that gets incorporated into future decision-making because either you now know what they are or more likely your agent or, or substitute decision-maker will. I hope that's clear. And again, we can come back to that um, at the end if not. So what does preparing for advanced serious illness medical planning look like? It, it's all about really finding your authentic values and your informed treatment preferences and documenting those so that either you have a script or your agent has a script. So when I say values, what do I mean by values? I mean, the things that are really important to you, you know, your life philosophies, but expressed in a way that is meaningful to us as clinicians so we can interpret it and make a medical decision, you know, write an order for the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments. And I've got some uh, statements up here on the screen that exemplify those kinds of statements that are helpful to me. If I hear somebody wants to live as long as possible, then that, that suggests to me that the use of machines is a good thing. That'd be consistent with their values. If I hear something like, I want to avoid the use of machines because of comfort reasons, it's uncomfortable, then that to me suggests that maybe not using machines when they're needed. Now, the problem is that people don't recognize that these value statements or things that they say uh, from a layperson's point of view conflict or compete with each other. Um, so I'll hear some people say, I want you to keep me as comfortable maximally as possible, and I want you to keep me alive maximally as possible. Well, I can't do both, right? I'll try and keep you as comfortable as possible, but if I'm gonna use machines to keep you alive as long as possible, I'm sorry there's going to be some uncomfortability associated with that. And so it's that, that's a problem in declaring or measuring values if people don't appreciate that trade-off and conflict. One of the areas where there's a lot of trade-off and conflict is in this quantity of life versus quality of life. Um, you're all only too familiar with the idea that the longer we live, there's a reduction in quality of life. And most of us would like to live as long as possible and then kind of fall off the cliff um, at the end of life. Um, but the reality is for most of us that the longer we live, um, more frailty, more reduction in quality, more reduction in function is just part of our natural journey. And so that is the same with deciding about treatments to life-sustaining treatments. If I maximally use life-sustaining treatments to prolong your life, um, I may be accelerating the reduction in quality. Even, even if you survive, there may be a reduction in quality. And unfortunately, many people experience um, being alive as a consequence of us using critical care resources to get them through their serious illness. They're now alive, but in a health state um, that's worse than death. And for each of you, I imagine you can conjure up in your mind, either someone you know, or thinking for yourself, what that might look like. I would not, you know, I would not want to be like that in that condition. And actually, that's very useful for us to know. And it's one of the questions on plan well guide so that if it looks probabilistically that you're going to arrive at that health state, then your doctor and your substitute decision maker can change goals and change directions. And so when it comes to um, documenting your values that doctors need to hear from you, in a way that they can use to make medical decisions, this is the best way. And this is what Plan Well Guide uses is uh, a scale that on one end it says, hey, tell me the kind of person you are. You want the medical treatments to focus on prolonging life or you know, quality, quantity of life? Or are you the kind of person that wants them to focus on uh, quality of life, maintaining quality and dignity in the last days? And, and then you, you answer that, you circle a number that best represents your views. In a similar way, we ask that question about, tell me the kind of person you are, are you okay with machines? Or are you not okay with machines? You know, and, and tell me what number rep best represents you. And then one of the innovations with Plan Well Guide is we're able to take a, um, those two scales that I just told you and make a grid 
And then the answers to those value statements uh, enable us to intersect uh, and direct right on to the cell. And that cell may be indicative of the medical treatment that's right for you. Now, what's, what's innovative about this is that it makes the whole decision-making process very transparent and very reliable. So right now in medicine, and this is why we have so many medical errors, you say something, I'll give you an example. You say, I'll give you an example from my clinical practice. I'm sitting knee to knee with a, a, a middle-aged woman whose mother is on life supports, organs are failing. I'm trying to explain a poor prognosis and uncover you know, what this woman, the older woman would have wanted. And the daughter says to me, my mom's a fighter. She should be given every chance. So if I stopped right there, I would take that, that expression of my mom's a fighter and I would impute in my head, okay, I'm gonna apply maximal medical treatments keep this woman alive at all costs. But what's missing from the conversation is that if she survives, she'll be in a reduced health state and would that have been acceptable to her? And, and this removes, it, this makes the decision-making very transparent. And you know, we're looking at those values and seeing how they connect to the treatments and making sure that this is the medical treatment that's, that's indicated. So that's what Plan Well Guide does for you is help you uh, connect your values to your preferences in a way that makes it transparent. But I don't want you to think that just because the, the, the guide says, oh, this is what's right for you, you shouldn't stop there because you need to invest a little bit of time and energy understanding what we mean by ICU care or what we mean by comfort care or what we mean by CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Now we know from research that um, lay people are well are very ill-informed uh, about these things. Think about when you go buy a car and how much research you put in understanding the features, the functionalities, the mileage, et cetera. And yet when you go into hospital, uh, how much do you know about CPR? <laughs> and yet frequently doctors will say things to people like, oh, well, if your heart stops, what do you want us to do? Because we're trying to respect your autonomy as an individual who can make choices for themselves, but you're not an informed consumer. You haven't done the research to know what's in your best interest. And so um, oftentimes that leads to medical error. Uh, oftentimes you're getting your information, which is misinformation from, uh, from TV. And so a big part of Plan Well Guide is what we call a decision aid, where we present um, information around the risks, benefits, and possible outcomes of if you go to the ICU, this is what might happen. If you go to the floor, receive medical care, this is what might happen. If you um, receive comfort care, this is what happens. This is the upside and the downside of that. Um, the issue around CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we have a seven minute video decision aid that we show and tell and help you think through if this is right for you. So when you go through this process, then you have an informed preference. And that is a value to us as clinicians when you get sick and we have to make a decision for you. So what I've been saying here is that currently, unfortunately, as a critical care doctor who studied medical decision-making for 20 years, our system is inadequate in how we prepare you or your loved one for making decisions in the moment when you get seriously ill. So we're adding stress and suffering to an already stressful condition. And there's a lot of confusion that's promoted because we frame it around end of life planning. And yet it's not that because we don't know you're dying when you present like this. And so I'm trying to change that paradigm and present some new tools that will better enable you to prepare for serious illness where you can prepare you and your substitute decision maker with your authentic values, informed treatment preferences. And that's what really led me to develop Plan Well Guide, which is a free online tool that when you go into it, you'll see a little bit of about explaining about what Plan Well Guide is and how to use this website. Um, then there's a section or a tab here that explains serious illness decision making, how that's different than end of life decision making, uh, a values clarification section, and this different types of care is the decision aid that explains uh, ICU versus medical versus comfort. And then now informed and, and having thought through all of this, you log in, you make a plan. And the output of your plan is what we call the Dear Doctor letter. And basically it's a, 
a written copy or an electronic copy that says, dear doctor, I've been through this planning exercise. I know the difference between end of life and serious illness. Here's my serious illness plan. Here's my values. Here are my treatment preferences. And there's also space to record your uh, questions. If you have outstanding questions that you wanna to talk to your doctor about, there's space to record your, that health state worse than death that we talked about, where you might wanna give some instructions that, you know, if this ever arrives, this is what I, uh, this, you know, this is unacceptable to me if it looks like I'm heading that way. So that's um, all web-based. I know some people don't like working on the web. Some people may get stuck. Uh, I wanna highlight that there's a couple of tools on the website that enable you to get help from people or from a bot. Uh, so you can try those out to help you move through this. Or like I said before, if you have outstanding questions, you can take them to your doctor and discuss them with him. Um, you know, if you Google advanced care planning, you'll find a myriad of tools and be careful of any tool that comes from the United States because their laws are different, their medical context is different, but there even are other Canadian tools. And so I just want to stress and explain that PlanWell Guide is new, it's innovative, it's different than any other planning tool because we're talking about serious illness and not end of life, because I frame this around uncertainty and and, and, and not actually writing instructional directives, but actually preparing you for the future when you make decisions in a shared decision-making model. And we use better tools to codify your values. And we have a decision aid to inform you about your preferences. And we use a grid to make this all a transparent experience. And so it really is of value. I'd re recommend it to you. If you're really not interested in working on the web, there is a, a paper version under the resource tab. Um, on the website that you can print and read. And the last four pages are the equivalent of the Dear Doctor letter. So you can, you know, you can work offline. Um, we are trying to collaborate with primary care docs in town. And so the idea is that they would engage you and say, you know, go off and do your planning and come talk to your family about it. And then come back to me and we'll sign you up on your goals of care designation form under the Alberta Health Services um, tools and to make sure you get the medical care that's right for you. A lot of planning professionals in town or, you know, across the country, lawyers, financial planners, accountants, funeral planners, others, they're also our partners in the sense that they sit knee to knee with clients trying to help them think ahead and plan ahead. And in that conversation that they have around their specialty, we're trying to partner with them so they give you a nudge to go do your advanced serious illness planning as well. And so that's why tonight we also have, you know, a lawyer and a financial planner speaking on this theme of thinking ahead and planning ahead. So just to close from my side, um, you know, optimal preparedness sort of looks like this from a medical point of view. I guess there's a legal form in here too. So I, I'm, I'm touching on some things that Sarah will speak about as well. But uh, the back thing here is a green sleeve um, that's an AHS tool where you're supposed to store your planning documents. The two things that are most important are a personal directive. Sarah will speak more about that. And this is the Dear Doctor letter, the output of uh, Plan Well Guide. And third, but not as important, is going to your family doctor to get this filled out where it denotes your level of care in the Alberta healthcare system. So that preference statement on your dear doctor letter, then with your doctor gets translated into a medical order for the use or non-use of life-sustaining treatments. I mean, if you're young, if you're healthy, uh, you know, you, you can wait on this part because it, you know, it'll be an ER doc or an ICU doc that actually sees you and feel, you know, has this conversation with you. Um, but if you're, you've got a, if you're living with a chronic illness or an advanced chronic illness, and you want to have those preparations in place, then okay to see that specialist or that primary care doctor to try and get that form filled out. So um, I want to just close with an anecdote of a woman uh, who her and her husband went through our planning plan well guide process. And, uh, and then she wrote me and she shared an experience with me where she was thanking me uh, because a few months after they'd been through the planning process, unfortunately, husband collapsed uh, sustained a significant head injury, a life-threatening head injury, rushed to Calgary on life supports, waited a few days, looked grim in terms of the prognosis. 
And she's obviously with the doctor making a decision to continue care or not, to withdraw life-sustaining treatments and let the husband go. And in that moment, that difficult moment, she could hear his voice because they'd been through this planning exercise. All the kids had heard his voice. They were all on the same page. And as difficult as the experience was of having to say, no, he would want us to let him go, they were able to do that. And, and in the days to weeks to months that followed, able to feel confident that they did what was right by him because they knew what his wishes were. So I leave that with you as, a, as an example of what we're trying to achieve here. As difficult as it is, to, if we think ahead and plan ahead, we'll have greater peace of mind that our plans are in place, but we'll also have done a favor for the stakeholders, our family members who are probably gonna have to enact those plans. And so I invite you to engage with Plan Well Guide. I ask your help in getting the word out and promoting this amongst your friends and colleagues. And if you are a, a planning professional and you wanna uh, partner with us to help get the word out, please reach out to me. My, my email is there, dkh2 at queensu.ca. If you're on social media, interact with us and share our material. So thank you very much. Again, write down your questions so you don't forget, or you can flip them to me in the chat room. And uh, I'll come back on at the end of the other presentations. Uh, right now, it's my uh, privilege to uh, turn the talking stick over to Sarah. And Sarah, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and make you a co-host. And then you should be able to share your screen as well and get started. So Sarah, thank you. Hi there. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can set this up. Yep. Okay. So hello, my name is Sarah LeBeau. I am a lawyer at Davidson and Williams. Um, at Davidson and Williams, we have a robust estate planning practice, uh, in part because we're the oldest firm in town, um, having been established in 1885. And as a result, uh, the firm has assisted with generations of estate planning clients. Uh, I'm privileged enough to work in the areas of wills and estates, which is generally comprised of estate planning and estate litigation. I'm excited to be here tonight. So thank you, Dr. Highland, for organizing this and inviting me to participate and welcome everybody who's on the call. Um, my presentation is meant to provide you with some general legal information. It's not legal advice. Uh, if you have any specific questions about your estate, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'll put my contact information up on the last slide at, at the end of my presentation. So our philosophy is that good estate planning reduces the probability of estate litigation. Legal advice to fit your unique circumstances and a thoughtfully drafted will, power of attorney and personal directive are incredibly important, not only um, to provide your loved ones with clear direction on your wishes, but also to limit the ways in which your estate planning could be vulnerable to litigation because litigation is not a great place for your loved ones to end up when they're administering you know, your affairs once you've passed away. In my experience, thoughtful and thorough estate planning benefits your loved ones in many ways. Um, it provides guidance on your wishes should you lose your ability to make decisions about financial and personal matters while you're still alive. It provides direction on the administration of your estate and the distribution of your wealth once you pass away. And as I mentioned, it reduces the probability that your estate will be subject to litigation, which is often ugly, uh, time consuming, and it can get very expensive. So components of a good estate plan. Your estate plan generally will include your will, your power of attorney, and your personal directive. And some people will create trusts either in their will itself or through separate uh, documents called trust deeds. These are not as common, but can be helpful tools, although I won't really touch on them in any great detail just because they aren't really as common. So the three key things that uh, form part of your estate plan are your will, your power of attorney, and your personal directive. And I'm sure many of you already have these in place. And if you do, excellent. You're off to a great start. 
Um, so most people are familiar with the concept of wills. Uh, they're really important because they appoint the person that you trust to administer your estate as your executor. Uh, this can be a trusted family member or a close friend or a professional like your accountant or your, your lawyer. Uh, you then add provisions outlining how you direct your executor to administer your estate. And once you appoint your, your executor and provide them with those uh, instructions on administration, you get to decide how your wealth and your assets will be distributed and to whom those assets are going. Um, you can set up trusts for minor beneficiaries, uh, and you can set out specific direction on how you want those trusts to be administered. And for younger folks uh, with minor children, we always recommend appointing a guardian. This is the person that takes over the care of your children uh, it, during their infancy, should you and your spouse pass away. Next slide. So... Again, this is just the basic will structure that you'll find in most wills. So you'll appoint your executor, you'll provide instructions on administration, you will appoint a guardian of minor children, you'll deal with the distribution of your estate assets, and that includes specific bequests, so specific gifts like gifts of you know, a special collection or a piece of personal property or a specific bank account. You'll also deal with the residue of your estate, which is the all the money left over once you've satisfied those specific gifts. And then of course, dealing with uh, putting in place minors trusts. So trusts that are put in place for the benefit of, of children under a certain age. So many people will say trust in place until this minor turns 18. Some people will say, I want this money held in trust until this youngster turns 30, because frankly, nobody has any common sense until they've turned 30. So every family is very different and special considerations may need to be made uh, when we have families that are blended. Um, so these modern families, a testator with significant wealth uh, or a testator with partnership or cor corporate interests and assets. In Southern Alberta in particular, um, there are challenges with the passing of the family farm from one generation to the next. Uh, both farm and business succession planning keep us very busy because they do require careful advice and structuring. And we often work with other professionals, including accountants and, you know, more holistic financial planners like Carol, who we'll be hearing from next to ensure that we're uh, affecting our clients' wishes while protecting assets from things like unintended tax consequences, which are the worst and we would like to avoid at all costs. So this concludes my comments on wills and why they're important, um, but wills only take effect once you've passed away. And so what happens if you lose your capacity to manage your affairs while you're still alive? Um, this is where your power of attorney and your personal directive becoming critically important pieces of your estate plan. Sometimes the loss of capacity is temporary and sometimes it's more permanent with clients suffering from dementia uh, or other types of age related uh, cognitive decline. These individuals need the support of a long term decision maker because their capacity is not expected to improve or return. So we deal with the incapacity proactively when we execute a power of attorney and a personal directive. And that's kind of the spirit of the evening, um, you know, proactively planning for aging basically and uncertainty. So a power of attorney document allows you to appoint a uh, trusted person to act as your attorney while you are still alive. And your attorney makes financial decisions on your behalf. An attorney doesn't have to be a lawyer. It can just be any person over the age of 18 years old that you trust with you, you know, making decisions about your money, your assets, et cetera. A personal directive document allows you to appoint a trusted person to act as your agent while you're still alive. And your agent makes personal care decisions on your behalf. And so if you don't have a personal uh, directive or a power of attorney in place and decisions need to be made, then a guardian or trustee would need to be appointed. And that's a court appointment. So it's, um, it's a very interesting process. 
uh, to get a guardian or trustee formally appointed by the court. So typically a family member or a friend with some connection to you will apply for appointment. This person would need to apply to the, the court specifically for this appointment. Uh, and the process is much more onerous and expensive than simply putting in place your power of attorney and personal directive, which is why we always uh, recommend when you come in to do your will that you also do your power of attorney and personal directive. Just to give you some insight and to illustrate why a power of attorney is, uh, and, and personal directive is very important, I'll just tell you a little story. And this is not an uncommon situation. We do see this happen. Um, so you go to the, your lawyer for a new will. She recommends that you execute a power of attorney and a personal directive. These two documents increase the cost of your estate planning by about $200, and you only really care about getting your will done, and you decide to save the money. Um, you don't execute your power of attorney or your personal directive at that time. Um, in terms of your personal circumstances, you and your spouse don't really get along, but you live together under the same roof. Um, you wouldn't really trust your spouse to make decisions about your money or your health care, but you're content enough to coexist. Um, there are certainly people that you trust much more um, and you have more confidence in when it comes to their ability to know you very well and, you know, um, to read you. So you have an accident and you sustain a brain injury. You're not expected to ever recover your mental acuity, and you can no longer make any financial or healthcare related decisions. And because you don't have a power of attorney or personal directive in place, someone's required to apply to the court for an appointment as guardian and trustee so that someone would be in place to at least make those decisions for you. Unfortunately, your spouse applies, notwithstanding that you don't really have a very good relationship and, and perhaps you don't trust that person and perhaps you wouldn't have chosen them to make those decisions on your behalf. Um, the application costs $2,500 and it takes your spouse three months to get it from the application stage to the point where they're granted um, guardianship and trusteeship over you. Once they're appointed, they recover the costs of the application from your bank account. And unfortunately, in the end, by choosing not to do your power of attorney and personal directive um, proactively at the time you do your will, maybe because you wanted to save a bit of money or maybe because, and this is often enough the case, um, you didn't quite understand the, the importance of these documents. The unfortunate consequence is that you end up paying thousands more in fees um, to, you know, have somebody appointed for you through the court process, and you've lost the opportunity to name your decision maker. So you're kind of stuck with the first person who decided to apply. So with that example in mind, let's just talk a little bit about powers of attorney, personal directives, and why they're important, if that example didn't already illustrate why they might be important. So the people you appoint are legally required to act in your best interests. Your attorney under a power of attorney can generally do things like open your mail, attend to your bill payments, renew your mortgage, collect on debts that are owed to you, um, cancel your credit card, sell or rent out your house, and the list really goes on. So they really can step into your shoes and administer your financial affairs as though you would. Your agent, on the other hand, under a personal directive, can make basically all other decisions that don't relate to assets and finances. So these are seen as the personal care decisions. And so the person that you appoint, your agent, can decide what type of medical treatment that you receive, where you live, with whom you associate, and the list goes on. We also typically include very general direction to your agent in your personal directive about whether you would like palliative sedation at the end of life, whether you would, would consent to the disconnection of life-sustaining treatment if it looks like you're not going to regain a reasonable life quality, so if you're in that more vegetative state, uh, and what you would want your agent to consider when making these kinds of end-of-life decisions. So regarding expressions of wishes relating to end-of-life medical care, 
If lawyers do include these in personal directives, we do so on a very general basis because we acknowledge that we aren't medical professionals. And frankly, detailed medical directions just don't belong in your personal directive. Um, you know, as you wouldn't go to your doctor to get legal advice, the same logic applies that you wouldn't go to your lawyer to provide, you know, fulsome and detailed um, medical instructions. And so what we do generally include in your personal directive is very general, but should give your agent a little bit of guidance if they were called to make end of life decisions for you with respect to disconnecting life support and palliative sedation. If it looks like you are terminally ill or in a vegetative state and it doesn't look like you will ever regain a reasonable quality of life. And so this is really why we recommend that our clients work with the plan well guide. This guide is really simple to complete, um, does require some, some engagement from the person completing it and that you will probably have to go and educate yourself with respect to you know, what comfort care means as Dr. Haland had alluded to. Um, but we found that the plan well guide is really um, helpful in that it fills in the gaps that we as legal advisors are just not qualified to give advice or direction on. And so the plan well guide assists individuals in planning for unexpected medical emergencies, serious illness, and it, it equips their decision maker and doctor to make decisions for them in a way that the general personal directive just can't, uh, which you know, we believe leads to a better outcome for both the person receiving the care and for the people having to make decisions on their behalf. Um, and so that really concludes my presentation. Um, hopefully, you know, you've found something interesting or helpful. Uh, and if you have any questions or would like to um, get in touch with me directly, my, my contact information is here. Otherwise, feel free to Google me. Um, and so I will, uh, I guess, unshare my screen. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that presentation. Again, we'll have time for questions at the end. And now we'll hear from Carol Hyema from Investors Group. Please, Carol. Well, thank you very much for your time and attention so far. And thank you, Dr. Halen and Sarah, for those great presentations that set us up well to start talking about the financial aspects of a critical illness. So my name is Carol Hyama. I am a consultant with IG Wealth Management. I have a husband and two kids with their spouses, five grandkids, and I've been in banking and wealth management since 1991. This is my assistant, Tracy Cage, and Tracy was with another consultant in Kelowna for 10 years before joining me. So I wanna just take a little step back and talk about what a holistic planner is and a holistic analysis. And it's just a little bit different than I'm gonna suggest most advisors in the marketplace. So a holistic planner is actually concerned with the whole life picture of you. A holistic analysis takes many non-financial elements into consideration, and then we coordinate your whole picture. So your financials, your insurance, and your investments now become part of the tools that we use and they fulfill a specific role in the destination that you're going toward in your financial plan. At, at the foundation of every plan is risk management. So this is a great uh, visual on where the holistic planner fits, perhaps with other advisors that you already work with. So your accountant very often is working with you on your taxes, your lawyer with your legal matters, banker, often with accounts, and sometimes your investments as well. And there could even be another extension here. You may be working with an individual investment specialist. Well, very much like a general contractor who's gonna help you build your building from the ground floor foundation up all the way up to the roof, they're gonna make sure that your house is built solid to last, on time, on budget, and that everything in that house works together for a very long time. So moving away from what I call that siloed approach, where you land up being your own general contractor, you're now moving toward a team of professionals. 
And so the, the diagram changes too. So you are always at the center of everything that we do. But at this point, we very often are working with either your own accountants and lawyers, or perhaps if your lawyers and accountants really just aren't up to this task, will then coordinate with specialists such as Sarah, who are just a little bit more specialized than writing generic wills. Behind the scenes, we have support of tax specialists, estate specialists, insurance, uh, securities and investments and lending specialists. This can save you actually a great deal of money when your team is working all together. And uh, Sarah can probably tell you what tax specialist costs if you are doing your own contracting again and having to hire these people. So a little bit about who IG Wealth Management is or Investors Group. Uh, we've been in business for over 90 years and we are a Canadian company. Our head office is in Winnipeg. What stands out to me about IG and why I chose to align my business with this company is we are your neighbors, your community, your friends. We live on the same cul-de-sacs and we find sharing with the community to be as critically important as worrying about provision and our business at hand. We are a very large firm and I think that's very comforting in difficult times like we're in now. And we have a culture of excellence. So we believe we're uniquely positioned in the Canadian marketplace as wealth specialty firm. You can see in our group of companies that all we do is wealth and we're highly specialized at it and we aren't distracted with a whole lot of other issues. So a holistic planner will generally look at six aspects of your financial picture from managing your cash flow, which is as much about strategy and where your money's going and making sure that that's to your best advantage as it is about budgeting. Uh, but preparing for the unexpected. And this is the bucket we're going to focus on just shortly. Planning for major expenditures, maximizing your retirement, sharing your wealth, and then maximizing your business success. And of course, tax efficiency is always at the basis of all these plans. So for today's focus, I've been asked to speak to you about preparing for the unexpected. You've heard a lot about the serious illness plan. We've heard about the legal aspects. And now we're gonna talk about the financial impact plan specifically. And in that aspect, we talk about income and asset protection. There are other aspects to this bucket, but that's what we're gonna focus on for now. Some of you may be wondering why it is I'm not talking to you about specific product like uh, disability insurance or critical illness or long-term care. Remember, these are the things that become the tools that fulfill your overall plan. So we move away from just product buying to solving specific problems and looking at your specific situation and what you might need. Not surprisingly, your income is your most significant wealth building tool. Any financial plan is dependent on being funded. And it's the one thing we seek to protect when we're talking about this area. So this is probably a self-explanatory screen, um, screen. Most people are working for a living and they're preparing for a time when they can no longer work or are unwilling to work. But what happens when something goes wrong? One third of people will have to access their savings in order to deal with a disability, critical illness, or a need to care for aging parents. That can leave you very short for your own aspiration and needs. So what are the numbers? 69% of retired Canadians did not stop working on the date that they planned. That's high. Among those Canadians who did not retire as planned, 41% cited personal health as the primary reason for retiring early. So let's explore a couple of myths. If I get sick, my government health plan will pay for my medical expenses. While in Canada, we tend not to see catastrophic outcomes like we do in the US. Here in Canada, the government will very often only cover some of your medical expenses. 
People are often shocked to find out that covered medical costs vary from province to province. In some provinces, it's not uncommon to pay upwards of 6,000 a month for oral cancer medications, which can be prescribed for up to a year. That's $72,000 that must be paid out of pocket if you don't have private prescription insurance coverage. And very often those private insurance contracts also have a spending uh, cap. The government also doesn't pay for things like treatments, uh, like uh, hospital parking, gas, and lunches on the go. And you heard somebody else talk about having to go to Calgary for treatment. That can be expensive when you don't live there. Another myth, I'll be able to save off my sa or live off my savings while undergoing treatment and not working. Most planners and advisors will suggest that you save between three months and six months of income or expenses for emergencies. But very often you're gonna be ill actually longer than that. So almost 20% of cancer survivors report limitations on their ability to work, even up to five years after diagnosis. 57% of cancer survivors had to reduce their hours at work, change their roles or quit entirely. And now with COVID, we're starting to hear about long haulers and the impact there. From the very last myth, I hear this actually quite often, I have adequate coverage in place. Well, sadly, you might not have the protection you actually believe you do. And the only way to know that is to thoroughly evaluate the detailed policy and the benefit choice that you agree to. There's a wide variety of coverage in the workplace from employer to employer, the length of time that you need to wait to be covered varies, the amount of time you're covered varies, and the definition of a disability that they use to determine when they'll pay a claim also varies. Many plans are coordinated with EI coverage before they'll play or pay, and that brings another plan into the picture. And individual policies may not believe or cover what you believed either. Uh, very often they only cover injury and not sickness. WCB only covers you at work. And you might be surprised to know that most disability claims are actually illness related, not injury. So what are your options if something happens? Insurance coverage obviously brings about the best outcome, but you may have to use your savings. You may need to retire your say or you may need to surrender your retirement funds. You might have to depend on family, take out a loan or a mortgage if you still qualify. And that might be hard if there's only one of you working still. You may, sorry, I got something over my screen. You may need to sell assets. And that's a problem because if markets are low, you might get less than what you actually need. And in worst cases, you may have to sell your business at a fire sale price. Sadly, this has happened. You've heard a lot of information tonight. So if I asked you to just close your eyes and imagine the people that you love and the future that you're building, what if it was at risk? So where can you find help? You can definitely give me a call and my contact information is down or is at the end of the presentation. You can call a life and a living benefits agent in your area and have them examine your situation. These are the things that I recommend that you look for in your advice. So is this person going to give you a full financial plan that has been coordinated in all aspects of financial wellness and has it been stress tested for common life events? That your insurance and your investments are chosen to protect and support your income, your family, and the future that you want to build. And that you have an estate plan with up-to-date documents that truly fulfill your wishes with no conflicts accidentally created. One of the things that I see happen very often, especially with estates, is that these wills are written quite a while ago and your life changes. So maybe you change your beneficiaries with the bank or um, you know, your investment person. And unfortunately, you unwittingly create a conflict with what you had said you wanted to happen in your estate planning documents. 
So how do we go about these things? Well, the first thing we do is we're going to have a conversation about your values, what's important to you, your dreams and your goals. What is the future that you're looking to build? Then we're going to get some clarity on where you are right now and what those gaps might be between your vision and where you are now. We'll explore some potential solutions and help you to determine the right course of action for you. And then once those plans are in place, we're gonna regularly monitor and adjust because life changes. I wanna thank you so much for your time and attention. And if you have any questions, here's my contact information. And I think we're gonna have some questions here shortly. Thank you, Carol. Yes, appreciate that. And uh, this meeting is scheduled till 830. So we have 20 minutes now where you're feel free to take yourself off mute, uh, raise your hand, either physically like that if you're on camera or there is a function at the bottom under the reactions button um, where I can call you to ask a question or drop it in the chat room. Um, maybe while we're just warming the audience up here to see if there's a question, I can engage you, Sarah, uh, with the question. Um, one of my uh, lived experiences as a critical care doctor is oftentimes um, people didn't know that they were named as that decision maker. Um, and of course, if they didn't know, then they weren't ever capacitated or educated on the on the um, what the values and preferences and wishes might have been. What 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 are best practices and what are the advice you give to say a client who comes in and says and decides, OK, this person's going to be my my agent. Like, what do you say next and how do we sort of get it so that at that point where they see me, they know who they are and what they're supposed to say? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, we always recommend that if you have appointed somebody in your personal directive to act as your agent or under your power of attorney, if you've appointed somebody to be your attorney to make those decisions for you, you should always sit down and have that conversation. Um, and, you know, there are resources out there for folks who, you know, may not be totally comfortable being that transparent. But I guess, you know, my logic has always been, you trust these people enough to appoint them instead of sort of them finding out by surprise or ambush in an ER, it, it's definitely a best practice to give them a call or sit back, sit down in person, or even, you know, if you're a distance away, you know, shooting them an email with a copy of your document. But, uh, you know, my, my advice is always let people know that they've been appointed so that they're not surprised. And, you know, having that conversation also opens the door to having um, more comprehensive um, conversations about, okay, you know, you said in your personal directive that you don't want life-sustaining treatment. What does that mean for you? And then, you know, you get into the conversation, you can glean more insight into, you know, the rationale behind those kinds of directions. Um, and so, yeah, I rule of thumb, transparency is always the best practice. And that's what we recommend to the client, long story short. Super, thanks. Um, one more anecdote, if I may, because it's pretty rare for a lawyer who's starting at the front end of helping people prepare for the finish. And then I'm a critical care doctor, so I'm on the receiving end of your preparations. One other observation that I wonder if we could talk out loud about is that, you know, oftentimes we're talking about a family or a social setting where there's multiple people involved, you know, and then there's this loved one who's critically ill. And then there's this singular individual who's frequently named the power of attorney or the, or the, uh, the agent. And we see a lot of difficulty because the reality is the family wants to have a say in the decision making and yet there's an individual named and somehow given that authority and well if that individual has communication skills and relational skills then they can navigate that family dynamic and, and it can work but I've also seen it where you know they don't have those skills and it becomes very conflictual and ten there's a lot of tension because one person's been named but you know, everybody loves that person in the bed and they'd never discussed it. And so everybody wants to say, mm -hmm. what would you, you know, advise in that scenario? And is there a, is there a best practice to, you know, name multiple people um, so that everybody is as equal say, is that an advisable step or not? 
Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, you appoint one, two, or maybe three people to be your agent uh, under your personal directive. We don't generally recommend appointing a team because that could just get chaotic. And really, the the um, we're trying to emphasize certainty in who you're appointing so that we can make the process as um, clear and painless as possible. And if you've, if you've got to consult with an entire team of agents, then you know that will undoubtedly lead to inefficiencies. And when you're needing to make decisions you know, in a time sensitive manner, it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to appoint a lot of people. And so basically my, my rule of thumb is one, two or three people maximum and our personal directive specifically directs that the, the person or few people that you appoint to be your agents to make those decisions um, need to consult with people like your doctor and your care team and your family members and those persons who are very close to you when they're trying to make those, those big decisions. So, you know, we direct them to consult with those close to you, but of course, their decision is the binding decision when when an individual lacks capacity and a decision needs to be made. So, I mean, there's no perfect solution, um, but that seems to be the most pragmatic solution. Thanks for that answer. It occurs to me that part of the answer should be that even if you just name one individual, you need to recognize that there's gonna be family members around them that are gonna to wanna to have a say and they're all gonna to wanna to understand what the person's uh, wishes and values were. And so, so really you're not just capacitating the named agent in your document. You, you've got to have a conversation with the broader social unit that will have an interest in your, in, you know, if and when you get sick or if and when you die. Although there may be only one person that's functionally the voice, um, you know, it's, it's, it, there's, a, there's a group dynamic at the end that I observe. And so it's just a little artificial that we use a document to name one person when it's very much a group dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question, does the power of attorney need to be a lawyer? Do you wanna address that? Yeah, absolutely. No, it does not. So your power of attorney, even though it says attorney, it does not need to be a lawyer. It just needs to be somebody that you trust to make your financial decisions. And that person has to be 18 years of age or older, and they have to have their own mental capacity. So you can name your best friend, you can name your spouse. Um, it does not have to be a lawyer. Otherwise, oh my gosh, imagine how many lawyers would be running around with powers of attorney and making decisions about everybody's finances, that would be, that would it, be interesting. I think it causes confusion because you use the word attorney there. Yeah. In the language, but uh, so I understand that. Yeah, blame the legislation. <laughs> what other questions do you have folks? And if you don't have a question, oh, please, I saw a microphone come off. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, what, how do you navigate uh, digital property? How do you know? I guess that's to the lawyer. Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. So your digital assets, um, this is kind of an ever evolving set of assets and it's, it's really interesting. Um, we just started including wording in our, our wills and in our powers of attorney because these really are like financial assets in a lot of ways. So not only do you have, um, you know, you have to provide specific authorization for accessing your digital devices, um, but also things like assets. So if you have Bitcoin or currency, um, so yeah, that's definitely a great question. So normally when it comes to equipping somebody to deal with those things, we put that in the power of attorney document. And then we advise clients that if you do have assets, we, we actually have a form of asset inventory, digital asset inventory, because you can have a zillion digital assets and a lot of people don't track passwords um, because now everybody's got the devices that remember your passwords for you. So what we do is we put provisions in the power of attorney that equip your attorney to handle those assets. And we also send people home with an asset inventory so they can start tracking, okay, I've got three email accounts, these are my passwords. I've got Bitcoin. I've got all of these online banking platforms that I'm using. Um, and so 
filling out the asset inventory and putting it somewhere really safe where you keep your other important documents like your will um, in like a safety deposit box, for example, that's a really great practice. Um, so yeah, while you're alive, you want something in your power of attorney document that speaks to digital assets. And with respect to the administration of digital assets, once you pass away, um, our wills are written so that they're broad enough to include those as just general estate assets that need to be administered by your executor. Um, but if you want more specific provisions to go into your will that speak to um, how you want those things administered, some people want their Facebooks deactivated, some people want to maintain a memorial page for friends and families to post and look at pictures, um, you can put those specific instructions in your will or you can just talk to your executor and do it informally. So it, it's really up to you and what you're comfortable with. And it's definitely a, a good talk to have with your, with your legal advisor with respect to how you wanna structure that, whether you wanna paper it specifically in your will and in your power of attorney document, um, or whether you wanna just have that conversation with your executor in, or attorney informally and let them know where to find and access your passwords. Thank you. Great question, great answer. What other questions do people have? I put a question to you in the chat room, which I'll verbalize now, as you think about these concepts that we've been sharing with you, you know, leaning in, thinking ahead, planning ahead from the three-legged stool point of view, um, what, what, what barriers are there? What, what's going on in your mind right now where, where you say, oh, you know, I can't do this because, because if we had a better understanding of your barriers, we might be able to, you know, do a better job helping you overcome those. Any comments as to reasons why you can't move forward in this kind of planning? Say too, as a holistic planner, this is often the difference between working with someone who is working with your full, complete picture. Because part of my process is going to be to review that will. Uh, it's great to have a, a, a well-written will, but if it doesn't stay current, or like I said, if you end up making decisions that change the outcome of what you were trying to achieve with your will, that's not going to help you. And so my process is to go through that with you. I usually have that bullet pointed on your annual review as to what's happening in your will, things that we need to remember when we're doing your planning. And things like incorporating your digital assets are something that we can talk about on an annual review basis and make sure that you've got a list somewhere that your executor knows where that is or your attorney if you should become in incapacitated. Thanks, Carol. Sometimes I have people saying that, you know, they don't want to come into the office because of the restrictions. Um, a lot of um, lawyers are now doing will instructions and, and estate planning instructions completely online um, just to kind of uh, remove that barrier because we appreciate that that's a very live concern for a lot of clients is, you know, we want to do our planning. We want to make revisions because we've changed some designations, but we are not comfortable coming in to talk to you personally. Um, so all of that can be done remotely. So either through Zoom, through telephone call, um, not only at the instruction stage of, you know, you providing your revised instructions, but also at the signing stage, we actually can, can um, sign wills remotely now, which is really interesting. Um, so COVID's really sort of pushed us along in innovating uh, how we deliver our, our services, which is, which is good. Yeah. Last call for questions. <laughs> Pat, you have your mic off. Are you? Uh... Nope. Okay. Well, anyway, then I think we'll wrap up. Um, let me thank you as an audience for engaging with us tonight. Thank you to my colleagues, Carol and Sarah, for their presentations. 
Um, tomorrow, you're going to get an email from me uh, just with an evaluation. So there'll be a link that takes you to answer a few questions about um, how this went for you. We're first time we've done this. And so, you know, if there's ways that we can communicate better to be more clear or more specific or talk about other stuff, please let us know. We'd love to, to hear from you. So please stay well, be safe. And uh, we'll, are you, do you have a question, Pat? Yes, I, I had some problems with the, the mute, neon mute. Oh, um, when I moved uh, back from British Columbia to Alberta, I was told that the wills were not valid uh, necessarily or might cost a lot of money to uh, have clarified. So I had them redone in Alberta. But the financial advisor who was with a national company, I am still with in BC and don't wish to leave him. Will that cause me any problems when I have to, when my will becomes, uh, you know, you know, when I die, in other words. So sorry, you have an Alberta will. I, I was told the BC one would be a problem up here. So I had a power of attorney done. I had the Alberta one done. Nobody said anything to me about my financial affairs. They are 